House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Welcome back into the House of Mystery. I'm Al Warren. Mr. David North Martino is back. I am back, and you're using my full name again. Well, yeah, you know, after, after seeing you with all the, you know, David's got wood. We saw that video. <laughs> He's talking about video. the uh, wooden dummy. Yeah, uh, well, shot. still, yeah. you're doing that, that martial arts karate stuff. That was yeah. pretty scary. <laughs> you know, Are you afraid? I behaved myself. Yes. Yeah, I have to be right. my, behave myself. I might get my ass kicked here. <laughs> this is terrible. I know, right? I didn't realize I... I got such a an animal as a terrorist <laughs> you know yeah but i tell you That's austin it. must be scared you know oh yeah uh, I, so um <laughs> one of your bands hey motley crew hey eh? uh they're they're suing each other right now. <laughs> you see that mick yeah. mars is suing the band i did see that i didn't really look too deeply into it i have a feeling this is a publicity stunt you think so yeah i don't know maybe because that's there's also something going on with Kiss and Ace Frehley too. So I, well, I don't yeah, know. I think the they're Frehley, trying to yeah. I think they're trying to get some some free advertising. You know, all these metal bands in their makeup, they're all suing each other. There's that White Snake too is into two bands now, and then there's oh. White, not White Snake. No, what's that other one? Um, the one that did Great White was it? Um, oh, Great White, yeah. Well, they've been yeah, yeah they've been separated for a while. They, yeah. Yeah, but there's all the, I'm seeing all these people coming up fighting. <laughs> and and like you said, Paul Stanley and Ace Freely. And, and I'm thinking, you know, it's becoming like housewives of the heavy metal. Yeah, right. <laughs> like they all wear makeup and spandex and they're all fighting just like that. <laughs> and they all have money. Yeah, you could do a TV uh, show on that. I, well, let's get on that. Yeah. Reality show. Yeah, yeah I would do it. Kind of horrific. Produce it. Yeah, of course, you, yeah, yeah. you would. But, of course. But you could. They'd all be scared of you walking in the room. It's like, <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, it's like karate guy coming in. They're like, oh, oh, behave. You know? <laughs> but anyway. So now, now speaking of bad makeup and uh, <laughs> scary things, we've got an author who's written a book that looks very scary. And uh, now the book's called The Night Belongs to Us and Other Stories. And the author is our guest, uh, Jess Landry. Thank you for being here. Hi, thanks for having me. So, Jess, uh, what made you decide to write this book? Like, what, you know, um, like, how did you get into doing this book? I noticed with the cover, it kind of looked like the lead singer of Motley Crue, so I was thinking <laughs> maybe it was something to do with that. But um, <laughs> I was going to say, hopefully you don't think my makeup's bad. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, um, I have been writing for a while, a very long time, since I was little, um, all throughout school, and then kind of took a break when I was older to, you know, do the uh, the adult thing of not writing and get a real job and all that fun stuff, and kind of throughout the past few years, I've dabbled back into it. I shouldn't say dabbled. I do it professionally, and, um, you know, kind of through COVID and everything, it kind of ended up being a bit of a a blessing in disguise where I was able to quit the day job and get into writing full time. So I, I do that now somehow, some way. But, but why, why dark? This is a darker um, collection, right? This is a darker story set. So um, what happened to you as a child? <laughs> <laughs> what, what didn't happen to me as a child? Uh, no, <laughs> I don't know. I've just always kind of been into the, the weird stuff. Um, you know, I was thinking before we jumped on here about, like, my own origin story, my villain origin story. And um, I remembered that when I was in kindergarten, um, we had to make up a, a book, make up our own story. And mine was about a dog who goes trick-or-treating. So I've always kind of, like, for some reason gravitated towards the weird, the weird and the dark and the creepy. Um, I don't personally don't think I'm weird and dark and creepy, but maybe I am. I don't know. Public perception <laughs> is everything. Uh, but yeah, it's just, it's stuff that I, I like to watch. I like to listen to music that's weird and dark and creepy, and I like to write stuff that's weird and dark and creepy. Well, I'm wondering, how, how did you find the uh, horror writing community? Um, I know b way back for me, I found uh, Shock Lines, which was a, a message board in, in a um, uh, bookstore, basically, online. But I was just wondering, uh, how you came across all the people. Yeah, for me, I um, when I started to take writing a little bit more seriously, maybe about 10 years ago or so, uh, 
I did some Googling, and I found <laughs> the Horror Writers Association, and I, I joined up with them, and I found them to be really welcoming and just really nurturing to new people. Like, they have a really great mentorship program that I went through. Right. Um, and they they have opportunities for you to, like, volunteer and help out and stuff. So I did a lot of that, and through that, I, I met a lot of interesting people online, uh, and just kind of, it kind of grew from there. And I found a lot of, you know, camaraderie in, in them because there's so many like-minded people in that community. And, you know, not just people who are in the Horror Writers Association, but there are people just generally online who end up finding you, um, after you kind of start your writing journey who are in the same boat and who kind of want to do the same thing. And so there's this sort of like, online kinship that ended up being formed just through many like-minded people. It's a really nice thing out there. Right, absolutely. Or can be anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have to wonder here. Now, you've got um, different stories on there. This is a series of small stories, right? Short yeah. stories. Yeah. Now, and I see one of them, you've got the daughter and mother escaping from Nazi Germany, and they get on the Hindenburg, yeah. um, of course, and that blows up. Of course. <laughs> Spoiler. Yeah, no. Well, I mean, I mean, if you know history. So are you, but are you keeping history in these stories realistic? Like you're following the real history, but you're just putting your characters into it? Or do you actually change history? Yeah, for that one in particular, that story is called Mudder. That was um, one of my first ones that people kind of started paying attention to, which is really nice. Um it was commissioned for an anthology called Fantastic Tales of Terror that was edited by Eugene Johnson. And so the whole theme of that anthology was taking real-life situations and blending them with the fantastical and all that fun stuff. So when I set out to write that one, I was like, well, what's something that I could take that hasn't really been covered that much and that I could spin in a different way? And so... I'm not going to spoil the big the big surprise after the the Hindenburg explosion, but there's a, another twist that happens after that that ties into um, some cryptid mythology that a lot of people responded nicely to, and that story uh, actually won me the Stoker Award in 20 oh god 2019 2018 wow. 2019 sometime back then. <laughs> but yeah, it was uh it, it's been great since then. Like you know, it's one of those stories that that people just responded really well to and. I, I still get some nice comments about it today, which is always reassuring. How, how was that for you when you get a, a Stoker Award? I haven't won one of those, but I won a Stoker Award, <laughs> and, <laughs> and it got a lot of attention. But I'm just wondering on the on this award, did it does, does it kind of put pressure on you, or how does that feel? Yeah, I you know I I wasn't able to attend the ceremony because it was still kind of like weird COVID times, and I have a little one, so it's hard to uh, get away, but um, just watching it at home online um, convinced that I wasn't going to win because you never think that you will, especially up against, there was some tough competition, I'm pretty sure. Um, but then winning and, and just being in this surreal state of what? Did they read the right name? Like a whole Marissa Tomei thing. Like, <laughs> no, that, that was a mistake. It must be. But afterwards, you know, you have people reaching out to you and, you know, sometimes other opportunities come from it. And it's it's been a really positive projection since then um in terms of writing it, it kind of you feel the fire under my ass a bit too to like really hunker down and take things a bit more seriously because people are paying attention um and so yeah since then i mean i've had a lot of, of opportunities which i'm incredibly grateful for and thankful for and things have things have been going well which is always nice <laughs> yeah it's a perfect it's good it's good to get the attention as long as you're ready for it, you can mm -hmm. kind of work with it because, you know, take advantage of it while it's there because, mm -hmm. you know, someone else. I, just talk, I was just talking to Dacker Stoker, actually, on, on messaging him the, just the other day because he did a segment for um, Howard Stern Show. Oh, nice. Meeting one of his um, favorite fans. And, oh, cool. <laughs> but I had no re <laughs> no, no, I had no <laughs> idea there's people that want to drink his blood and all that stuff. Oh, that's a little okay. I yeah, mean, whatever, like he, whatever your yeah, no, is, yes. I mean, there's yeah. these real kind of crazy fans, and they're like so they live just live for um, Bram Stoker, and because he's the living relative, they want to they want to have his blood. They want to, and they just it's just like I'm thinking, holy cow! You guys, it's like, why did you do that? And it's like, well, you know, he did it, but it was I just think I don't know if I would do that myself. Yeah, I mean, 
I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm not at the blood drinking level yet. Uh, maybe one day, <laughs> fingers crossed. But uh, I mean, yeah, whatever floats people's boats. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> as long as you know, just don't tell. Yeah, yeah no, just don't tell them where you live. That's all. Yeah, I always exactly. give them Dave's address. You yeah. know, when I'm. <laughs> And they show up at his place, and he's got kung fu, so it's okay. Yeah. You know, I was yeah. going to say, you were talking about his karate skills earlier. Exactly. I... So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, he, he can handle himself. Not sure it works against okay. vampires, but, you know, it's okay. No. You never know. <laughs> well. v- vamp foo. Vamp, vamp foo. foo. That's the new one. I like it. <laughs> Are you? Are, but so, when all of these stories here, are you have you taken not only because we just talked about the Nazi Germany and Hindenburg, but on all your your short stories, do you take real life events and throw characters into it, or are they just all made up? Like, how do you create your stories? Yeah, I think you know, there's a good mix of everything in here. Um, I I throw a lot of my own relationships. Oh gosh, no. I, <laughs> I don't want to throw anyone under the bus. No, no. Give us uh-huh. names. Yeah. <laughs> names and addresses. Yeah, yeah. 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 We'll, get them, we'll get them on the line. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I feel like writing from experience helps add um, a bit of a reality to things, a bit of a, a more of a truth to everything. And so, you know, I take from my, my troubled youth and I, I kind of <laughs> – expunge it upon the pages and I kind of live my therapy through there instead of paying someone to tell me that I'm How dare you? Up. It's fine. <laughs> I, I do it this way instead. It's, it's much better. And I can work through it at my own pace, which is nice. But yeah, there's a lot of a lot of women, a lot of women in my stories. Um and a lot of mother daughter relationships that are, you know, not in tip top shape. Obviously coming from real life. We won't go into full detail <laughs> there, but yeah, there's there's a lot to unpack. Like anybody, I'm sure, you know, we all have issues with our parents in some way, shape, mm. or form. Um, everybody could write the book on it, I feel like. Uh, and, you know, me now having my own daughter, I'm like, oh, God, what am I doing to her right now? What is she <laughs> going to write about when she can actually write something? Because she's only six. But it's like, yeah, how how am I messing her up in the way that my own mom messed me up? Looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, you know, you mentioned you were you were commissioned to to write a story for for a magazine. Oh, no, well, it was actually an anthology. And I'm just wondering, do you find it easy when um, you get an invite from an editor to come up with a story? Or I, I'm just asking because you know, even with some open calls, I look and I'm like, I don't have any ideas. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, sure. and it takes me, the you know, like a month. Real, yeah. right? <laughs> Absolutely, I hear you on that. <laughs> uh, I find it easier because then it's like literally spoon fed to you, like here, write about this, and you're like, okay, I'll see what I can do. And sometimes, yep. you know, sometimes it doesn't work out. Like I have one story in here called uh, "I Will Find You Even in the Dark" um, that was nominated for a Stoker as well a couple of years ago, and um, it was. And originally commissioned by a magazine and I wrote it all up and I was all happy with how it came out. It was super good. And then they read it and they were like, um, no, it's too dark. <laughs> That's how it always like, happens. What? <laughs> yeah. When you like, like what? it, what you, like? <laughs> you think this is a great story. They don't want it. They only want it when you write it and you're like, I don't know if this is very good. And then you send it in and it gets, it exactly. gets taken right away. Yeah, that's the laws of the universe. So, yeah. Don't, don't, the message here is don't be proud of anything that you write and then send it out into the world and people will love it. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, so that's where I was like, oh, well, now what do I do? But then, luckily, um, Dim Shores picked it up for their anthology, Dim Shores Presents Volume 1. And, yeah, I had some success with it there, too. So, Everything, you know, every, everything works out in its own mysterious way, I guess you could say. <laughs> uh, you know, um, one of the things I noticed in your, um, in the promo for this book, it talks about how you blur the lines between uh, genres. So what, what, what does that mean for someone that, uh, what are you doing to blur the lines? I mean, how, how, what, do you, what are they getting out of the story is what I'm trying to say. I hope they're getting a lot. <laughs> but in terms of blurring stuff, you know, horror is obviously my my main bag of tricks. But within genre, there's also there's a lot of sci-fi. Uh, there's some some kind of Greek mythology as well in there. Um, 
it's, there's a lot of like there's action horror and there's like quiet horror so it's kind of like a mixed bag it's really a mixed bag of horror um but there's so many you know sub genres within the genre right that it's like it, it, it's fun to kind of untangle some things and explore them in different ways and kind of revisit them in, in ways that people might not expect and it's just yeah it's just a fun thing to for me anyway to kind of subvert expectations on a few things especially having all my stories m mainly about women um you know there's obviously we've come a long way we've come a long way in the genre let's just say that and um i like to not have the the heroines be so you know heroiny in a way oh good yeah heroiny <laughs> that's a word right <laughs> heroiny yeah that's uh, <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm a writer not a speaker so <laughs> <laughs> heroiny uh, <laughs> your characters where do they come from like what are you are you um dreaming them up or do you run into people that you sort of pick up some sort of thing from them or do you see people on tv how how does this happen for you it's a lot of different things there's for sure a lot of myself in in some of these ladies um there's also you know it's it's a bunch of different things really i i always try to think about this question or questions like this about like, you know, where do ideas come from? Where do characters come from? And the honest answer is, is that I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's from heroin. Maybe it is. <laughs> Maybe I'm a little heroiny right now. But, <laughs> but no, it's, it, it's one of those things that like, it just kind of comes, you know, and when it comes, I just start writing and I, I, I usually, <laughs> this is going to sound terrible. I don't think too hard <laughs> right at the first draft stage anyway. I just kind of go with the flow and whatever spills out is what spills out. You know, it's usually a pile of word vomit, but then it, we, we edit it to make it into something a bit more shiny and a little less smelly. And it usually comes out as something, something somewhat legible anyways. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> but yeah, I honestly like, it, it's a little bit of me. It's a little bit of, you know, the relationships I, I have in my life right now. Maybe some friends have ended up in here and they'll never know because I want to keep them as friends. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a little bit, a little bit of everything. But when you're creating these characters, do, do you have an inner monologue? Can you hear the characters? I, I'm just trying to find out if you're hearing voices, actually. I know I am. <laughs> but, uh, but, but can, can you, because not everybody has an inner monologue. And I'm just wondering, is that how you is that how you create uh, dialogue, or how does it work for you? Yeah, for me, I I can hear I, I hear voices. I hear voices right now. <laughs> Who are these men that are talking? I know. To me? <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I I hear voices. I also I see like I can see uh, scenes and images really clearly. Um, I have a very randomly visual mind, um, and. It's kind of weird too. I'll, I'll let you in on a little weird thing that I actually have at this condition called, um, hypnagogic hallucinations. Mm. So at nighttime, when I'm like in between, you know, being asleep and being awake, the brain is, is still kind of active. I, I can see things and sometimes it's nice things like, the past little bit, I've been seeing the ocean floor on my ceiling. So I'll see like turtles swimming by all merrily. It's like finding Nemo on my ceiling, basically. But other times I'll see shadow people or when I was younger, I used to see a giant spider at like the corner of my room, just kind of hanging out. Um, and then occasionally I have auditory hallucinations as well. So sometimes I'll hear music and it's, it's very bizarre. So it's all real. Sometimes it's all. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Who are these people that have been watching me sleep, and why is there an ocean on my ceiling? Exactly. They don't allow you to drive, do they? <laughs> they do, but don't oh, tell no. them. <laughs> wow. Yeah, no, it's a it's a very weird thing, but then, and I just recently found out that a lot of my aunts um, have the same thing as well, so I guess it's a hereditary thing that's been running in the family for a while, and they were all they were all creeped out about it, but I'm like, yeah, more, give me more shadow people, give me more <laughs> creepy things staring at me while I'm trying to sleep. And and your husband's alive. He's, he's alive. He <laughs> <laughs> one time one time I like slapped him while I was sleeping, uh, and he didn't leave me then, so he's not going to leave me now. Well, I was <laughs> thinking more like you woke up and he's gone, and all that was in the side of the bed was a shovel and some dirty shoes. <laughs> I mean, I mean, the night is young. Things can happen. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, we'll call him on the other line. We'll see if he's still there. 
No, he's not. He's at work, I swear. Proof of life. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's down in the basement. If you set out to scare people, is that sort of what you do when, you, when you're when you putting together a story? Are you thinking about your reader? No, sorry. Uh, <laughs> oh, no. <I> was... <laughs> <laughs> sorry, reader. Uh, <laughs> no, I just, honestly, I write stuff that, that I like, stuff that interests me, stuff that, you know, I feel like I have to get out there. Um, for me, for reading and for watching movies and stuff, I don't, I don't get scared very often. Um, war movies scare me of all things. I, I don't like watching war movies, but give me, you know, all the blood and guts and everything. And I'll just, you know, be knitting as I'm watching it, enjoying myself, sipping a tea, you know, doing, doing what I do best. And so it's kind of interesting to me though, to see people that do get really scared by, by different things. Um, I have a, one of my stepsisters is <laughs> the biggest chicken oh my. in the world. And so I somehow convinced her one year to go to a, a haunted maze um, around here. And <laughs> while we were going through, I kept saying her name, like, it's okay, Carly. Like, you'll be okay, Carly. And the, the scare actors heard me saying her name. So they picked it up and started taunting her as we were going through the maze. And it basically traumatized her for life, and now she won't even talk about it. So <laughs> I, I enjoy stuff like that. I enjoy seeing people being scared. Uh, I, I'm hopeful that, you know, people are scared at, at what I'm writing and what I'm putting out. But if they're not, that's cool, too. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, she, she's probably in a in a, in a insane asylum right now. <laughs> she is. Yes, she is. <laughs> you know, but you're – well, do, do you kill off people you don't like? <laughs> Or do you put them in bad situations? Like, even if you don't really know them that well, or you know what I mean, just people, mm -hmm. do you draw from real people at times? So I wonder if you take um, someone that's really evil or you don't like or you think is terrible and incorporate them in one of the, let's say, victims of your books. I mean, for me personally, I, I try to surround myself with people that I do like, so that way I don't have to kill anybody, both fictionally and not. Um, but, you know, there's a lot, obviously a lot going on in the world right now with some pretty terrible people, you know, leading, leading people around. And that definitely seeps into things for sure. So, you know, you find yourself maybe even subconsciously writing those, those types of people as your villains and then, you know, feeling a little good about yourself when you do give it to them at the end. I think there's, there's some nice poetic justice in that for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I mean, in a way, you've got more control. If you're if you're writing nonfiction and and a true story, you're sort of stuck with, you know, some sometimes the bad guy gets away, you know. Mm -hmm. But oh, gosh, and, yeah, yeah, and and when you're controlling it and it's fictional, you can sort of give it to them. Yeah, know? it's always nice. <laughs> <laughs> so, so where do you draw from? Like, what is what is your horror favorites, or or what do you? read maybe you do other things other than horror i yeah no horror horror is everything uh i i for my office anyway you can't see it nobody can see it right now except for me but it's very messy but i have a lot of just paintings and posters and stuff that inspire me um i have a hellraiser poster on the wall i have a thing poster on the wall those are two of my favorite movies um i love american werewolf in london too that's another one of my faves and I just have spooky art. I have, you know, bats and bloody hands. And I have an original an original Clive Barker painting hanging up on the wall. That's like my, my prized possession <laughs> that I look to often for inspiration. Um, I'm a big fan of his as well. I have all his stuff. I've read all his books. And I like any, to... Any dead like, bodies or anything? Not in my office, <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> we won't tell anyone. The basement is a different story. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> You should see my basement. It looks like a morgue. There's probably a few bodies hidden in the walls um, <laughs> from the, the previous owners, not from me, I swear. <laughs> well, speaking of Clive Barker, are, are you more into extreme horror, or does, does your work kind of fall more towards the quiet horror, or are, do you find yourself somewhere in between? Yeah, I think I'm more quiet. Um, the extreme stuff, I'm, I'll leave to <laughs> the people that do it well. <laughs> <laughs> um, but even Clive Barker, you know, when I first read his stuff, I was pretty young, probably too young to read that kind of thing. But um, it had started with, of course, Stephen King. I think Stephen King is like the, the prerequisite for every horror writer or horror lover in the, in the universe. Um, 
which is not a bad thing. He's great. And my first kind of foray into Stephen King was actually the Dark Tower series, which is more fantasy than anything. But then, you know, I started to look for more, more, you know, different, right? Because it was yeah. it's all just, you know, these white dudes writing creepy stories, which is fine. Like, that's kind of the basis of everything. But there has to be more than just that one perspective. And so, I mean, Clyde Barker's a white dude, but he's also a gay man. And so it adds this whole other level of, for me, reading his stuff, like, it's very, very sexual, very, like, coming of age, sort of finding out who you are uh, in the most times the most grotesque way that you possibly can, which is cool. <laughs> I thought it was great. And, you know, he does a lot of painting and he, he does photography as well. And I just really, his stuff like resonated with me and it still does. And I still look to him for inspiration to this day. Cause I just think he's the most creative person out there. Why Barker was gay. Yeah. He still is. Well, just... <laughs> <laughs> well I never knew that. Yes. Wow. Yep. I'm in shock. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know what to say. I'm, you got me speechless. I didn't does it, realize. Does, does it change your perspective on him at all? No, it just makes me kind of go, well, I, yeah, I, I should have had him on the show. <laughs> <laughs> if you watch Hellraiser, you know, it, it kind of becomes very clear that it's like, oh, okay, there's something a bit more going on than just, you know, this lady who likes her husband's brother. It's, there's something deeper going on there, and it's it, it's fun to watch and read his stuff and like look for all the the little things underneath that you might not realize otherwise. Yeah, I didn't have a clue, but I've never really read any of his stuff. I've you know yeah. of course seen the stuff you know, mm -hmm. but I've never read any of his stuff, so I've never realized, um, never thought about it. Well, that's crazy. Yeah, well, Nightbreed is also a super gay movie. Uh, <laughs> having <laughs> watched it in the best way possible, it's a great movie. But it's like, yeah, this is a this is a very gay movie. I love it. <laughs> Give me a whole new appreciation for horror and Clyde Barker. You know, there you go, there you go. This is a learning podcast. This it is what it we're certainly doing. is. Stephen King. You know, who's he? <laughs> <laughs> Never heard of the guy. <laughs> no. No, you know, if he actually gets a book published, I, I might ask him to come on the show. <laughs> you know, I like One to see day. that. Well, they're going to have an actual book out, right? Cause, yeah. <laughs> what else are you going to talk about? So, <laughs> so what do you hope people take away from your stories then? If if you're not really looking to scare them and you're just writing what you think, but when you're completed, like this book, The Night Belongs to Us, um, someone goes out, buys it, uh, takes it home and reads it. What is mm -hmm. it you hope for them? Like, is it just, is it purely entertainment, nothing else, or is there something more to it? Mm, good question. I wish I was deep enough to have a deep answer for this. Uh, <laughs> well, sometimes <laughs> things happen organically, right? Because yeah. there's, there's writers that'll sit there and plan, plan out their story and have some meaning that they want the reader to get or connect with. But sometimes you just write the story and then a lot of writers will say, oh, I didn't plan that, but this is what yeah. it means. No, for sure, for sure. And I've definitely fallen to the uh, the former camp of, oh, I didn't really plan anything, but I hope you find something in it. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, there's definitely, you know, like I said before, a lot of strained relationship stuff in here. Um, it's coming from my own experience. Um Hopefully some of the stories have a bit of a catharsis, too, with the relationships. They might not end positively all the time. Uh, for the most part, they do end negatively because that's just how I am hardwired. But, you know, if somebody reads something and sees their own relationship with a parent or a sibling or a friend reflected in there and sees that, you know, there is some sort of maybe grotesque hope in some way, then that would be pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah, but I, I hope, I hope that it's hopeful for sure. And, you know, the, the titular story, The Night Belongs to Us is, is probably a good example of that too, because that's about a relationship between two women who are both in a way having a strained relationship with their own mothers. Um, and then they both come to this realization at the end that, not spoiling anything, but you know, that, <laughs> They they don't necessarily need their blood family. They can have their own chosen family, and that is is enough for them. And so, 
you know, that'd be a nice takeaway for someone too, I hope. Yeah. 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 Well, Why not? you know, talking about, uh, you were talking earlier about, uh, you know, Stephen King, Clive Barker, um, getting into, uh, from the 70s into the 80s, where in the 80s, horror became huge. That's where I kind of, kind of fell into, to reading mm-hmm. horror books and, and, um, but, uh, by, by the early 90s, you know, uh, horror kind of, the genre itself as, as a, as a written form kind of imploded a little bit. What do you think mm-hmm. about modern horror today? Do, do you think that there's, there's a comeback, a resurgence of, 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 of this type of, of this type of, uh, fiction? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I, I worked in publishing for a bit too. Um, a few years ago, I, I was the managing editor at Trepidatio Publishing, and I also worked with Journal Stone. They were essentially the same company. And so one thing that I really wanted to do as the managing editor was bring more, you know, diverse voices to the forefront, um, and to help those who you know, haven't really had the opportunity to get their works out there, to get their works out there. Right. And so when I started doing that, um, that was around the time when I was seeing more, you know, more women, more people of color uh, starting to get into it and to find their own footing in, you know, what was predominantly white and male before. And now I think we just, we have, we have so much and it's wonderful and we need even more because there's always there's only been one POV for such a long time. Um, me too. I, I'm a child of the 80s and 90s, and so I grew up watching and reading all of that that same sort of horror. And especially for movies, because um, I'm also a screenwriter. But especially for movies, um, just you know, when you're younger and you're watching stuff that kind of very clearly was not made for you, it kind of makes you feel like you shouldn't be watching it, and makes you feel a bit awkward watching it. And so I've always gravitated more towards the female-led stories um, because that's always what I wanted to see more of. And I'm, you know, it, it's it's really heartening to see so many women uh, now both writing more, uh, directing more, screenwriting more, and just getting more of that female-led horror out there. I'm a big fan of that. You know, America went to hell when they decided to let a woman go to work. <laughs> well, I'm Canadian, <laughs> and so <laughs> no, I say that. Great up here. <laughs> no, I said that. I say that. No, I am. Um, I'm a Canuck too, actually. Just so oh. you know. But I, um, what I did was, um, I interviewed a guy in Seattle that had been put away for murder back in the '50s, and he didn't yeah. do it, and he got out, and. I don't know, 10 years ago or something. So I was spending time with him to write a story in a book. And when I met him, that's the first thing he said to me. <laughs> he said, you know, America's gone to hell, and the reason is they decided to let a woman go to work. Uh, are we Everything. sure he didn't do the murder? Are we sure? <laughs> no, I, but you see, that became kind of the point of the story. Uh, because throughout the whole time I spent with him in a year, he was he was the biggest asshole you'll ever meet. <laughs> <laughs> in your life. I'm, and I'm not Ooh. kidding. But the idea was just because he's an asshole doesn't mean he can be put away for something like murder that he didn't do. That's true. Do you that's know what I mean? True. And I think that's what became the point of the story. That's how I turned it into it. And, um, yeah, so anyway, I just... <laughs> We, we need an asshole jail to just put all the assholes. <laughs> well, you we see, yeah, I was thinking about that. You know, we could have one of those. Put it in Florida because then it saved the traveling fees for most people. But <laughs> the entire population would be in. I mean, it's like <laughs> <laughs> just just shuffle the government into the. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, but as a horror writer, mm-hmm. um, and in these modern times, I like mm-hmm. to ask this question because uh, it seems like um, there's a lot more awareness. And sensitivity, and so people are becoming much more aware, much more sensitive, and thinking about it. But when you're writing horror, are you conscious of the type of violence and or sex or um, dark things that you write on the paper? Oh, for sure, yeah. Um, especially as a woman, I I don't do sexual violence. I'm not I'm not into that. Um, I'm not going to write about that. At least not in like graphic detail. I don't see the point. Uh, for me personally, um, and you know, there's there's a lot of stuff that's going on in the world too that um, 
I specifically kind of grabbed from um, going back to the title story, The Night Belongs to Us. Uh, in a way, it's about, as well, the um, missing and murdered Indigenous women uh, genocide that's kind of been going on around around these parts, both in Canada and in the U.S. And so I think that as long as you are aware of what you're writing about, if it is a super sensitive subject, if you go into it with a level of understanding and, and grace and tact, like as much as you can, then, I mean, I don't want to say it's okay, but we, we can't shy away from these things also is the thing. We have to, we have to talk about these things. And re- reflecting back to the horror movies of the 80s and 90s, they were all reflective of society, right, in, se- in the 70s too. Everything, everything in horror is reflective of what's going on at the time. So, like, you know, Romero's dead movies, they're all very reflective of, you know, what was happening in in the 50s, what's happening in the 80s, you know, all that stuff. And I think if we approach it in a way that is compassionate and understanding, then I think that is good. It's a good sort of therapy for us to kind of work through our own feelings on it as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I always wonder about that because some – some people are very aware and they're right mm-hmm. on it and some aren't, you know, and it's mm-hmm. just, uh, it's kind of interesting to hear the different points of view. Sure. Um, so how are you adapting to social media or are you or like, or do you like to be all over Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, dancing and all oh, that God. stuff? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I watch a lot of TikTok with my daughter. We watch a lot of cat videos on there. That's uh, <laughs> probably the extent of my TikTok usage. Um, I, I I try to to do a social media presence, but well, I find it to be such a such a dumpster fire of a place all over, you know. And it's like it's it's good for promo and stuff too, and it's good to you know communicate with fellow horror writers and fans and all that. But I feel like the bad outweighs the good a lot of the times, just because it's the spread of misinformation, the, all the hatefulness that goes on in there. It's 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 more exhausting to to be on it than anything. And I I am not that big of a fan. No. It's like a big <laughs> bar fight. Exactly. You can't look away. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can watch it for a while and you can get into it if you want or you can, it's better to stay out of it, you know. Exactly. But, you know, it's kind of crazy. <laughs> so how do you want people to find you? Do you like readers to find you? Do you have a website? Do you have any place that you, um, you know, yeah. sort of set up for readers? For sure, yeah. I, I have my website. It's JessLandry.com. I sometimes remember to update it, so there's that. Um and I, I do, like, as far as social media goes, I, I'm probably on Facebook the most, just spying on people, honestly. Uh, but all my <laughs> my handles across all the social platforms are the same. I'm at JessLandry28. So if anybody wants to connect, I'm, yeah, mostly on Facebook, I'm trying to do Instagram a bit more, and then Titter. Titter? Oh, my God. Titter? What am I thinking? I haven't been on that one. <laughs> uh, anyway, <laughs> Twitter. <laughs> Twitter, I'm trying to just get rid of completely because, yeah, that's the axis of trash right now, I find. <laughs> yeah, yeah. the uh, Yeah, it's kind of one of those things. It's there. But, you yeah. know, that's Twitter, not Titter. I haven't yeah. watched Twitter. <laughs> don't find me on Titter. I don't, I don't know what's going on on there. No. <laughs> Dave's on there all the time. He spends, <laughs> he spends the whole time on Titter. <laughs> He's you on know. there right now, actually. <laughs> yeah, he can't, he can't get off to it. He's stuck. I'm stuck. He's stuck on that. He's That's on, it. He's yeah. on the nip, nipple ride. Yeah, it's <laughs> terrible. Awful. So when you were writing through the pandemic, did it, do you think it affected you? Were you one of those writers that could write through all the weirdness, or does it sort of shut you down? Yeah, no, it was great. I love being home. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> I don't have to yeah, go anywhere, you, and I can keep my sweatpants on. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, but, the, you know, but the tension, you know, like, you know, every time you, you do turn on the news or you flip it through your Twitter looking at cats, all of a sudden there's, like, <laughs> some guy in the Costco yelling at the woman because he's ma- she's telling him to wear a mask. And, and like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, all the tension yeah. going on outside of the house. I mean, did, mm-hmm. did that, do you think that seeps into your writing or affects you, or do you, can you just blow right through it? No, for sure seeps in. I think it affects, it affected everyone in some way, that's for sure. Um, I, 
for us, it, it got to the point where we were watching the news almost too much. And yeah. then we just had to like stop because at least for my husband anyway, he has anxiety issues and it was just feeding into him in, in a very bad way. So it was like, we can't, we can't watch this every day. We can't look at these numbers going up. It's like, it, it's too, too much. And then being home all day for him and I, <coughs> excuse me, and our, and our daughter as well. It was like, Oh God, we need daycare. We need, we need stuff. Like we need something. We can't all just be in our house together, but yeah, it's um I haven't been in Costco actually since since before the pandemic cuz I just refuse now cuz it's it was bad before and now it's just hell hell on earth basically. Yeah, yeah, well, for sure, you know. Walmart with a membership, you know. Um, yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> was that Walmart Plus or whatever? Like, who yeah. do they think they are? <laughs> yeah, I just I don't waste my time on any of that stuff. Mm-hmm. Too many people, too, right? You know. Mm-hmm. Oh gosh, yeah. We um we just came back from a trip. We went to uh, London and Paris, and um, we were in Paris during the marathon because my brother-in-law uh, ran it of all things, which is like good for him. But why run a marathon? But anyway, when we um, we had to take the, the the subway, the metro, while we were there, and it was just jam packed. And yeah. I was like, "Oh no, I'm coming back with something." And lo and behold, here I am on the on the scale, the tail end of uh, something. I don't know, not COVID, but a nasty cold. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. The train, the trains. It's a good system, but I got sick every time I was on it in London or England, oh, yeah. anywhere. I always got sick. People yeah, sneeze and yeah. everything, and it's just so crammed, and it's, yeah. Yeah, too much. Yeah. And I come from a city where we don't even have the subway. <laughs> like, we just have buses, and it's like, no, I think I'll just walk everywhere when I can, when it's yeah. not, you know, minus 40 degrees. <laughs> yeah, it's Canada. <laughs> yeah, it's Canada. <laughs> minus, minus 40, wear your shorts. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sounds like New England. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're two in the same. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Well, okay. So now we'll wrap this up, and we will have everything up on our website. You know, of course, like I said, your your website and everything. And, of course, the book is called The Night Belongs to Us. And mm-hmm. our guest is the author of that book, Jess Landry. So thank you for being here. Thanks, guys, for having me. This was a good chat. I'm sorry about Titter. And <laughs> 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 or maybe I'm not. I don't know. Yeah. Time right. will tell. <laughs> Thanks, Jess. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.